This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We begin today's show with an update on a case that could shape the future of free speech and the right to protest in the United States. Final arguments are underway today in Washington, D.C., for the first trial of the nearly 200 people arrested during President Trump's inauguration. As demonstrators, journalists and observers gathered in northwest D.C. after the inauguration on January 20th, some separated from the group and broke windows of nearby businesses and damaged cars. Police officers then swept hundreds of people in the vicinity into a blockaded corner in a process known as kettling, where they carried out mass arrests of everyone in the area. The first so-called J-20 trial could go to a jury as early as today and involve six people, including one journalist, Alexi Wood, a freelance photojournalist. The defendants face multiple felony and misdemeanor charges, including multiple counts of destruction of property. Evidence against the defendants has been scant from the moment of their arrest. Earlier this week, Superior Court Judge Lynn Leibowitz threw out the felony charge of inciting a riot for the six people on trial now, meaning they now face up to 50 years in prison, prison instead of up to 60. This comes as police conduct an inauguration day, as police conduct on inauguration day has come under scrutiny by the ACLU, and the chief detective in this case is a police union official who tweeted that police showed great restraint during the inauguration. Well, for more, we go to Washington, D.C. We're joined by Jude Ortiz, a member of the organizing crew of Defend J-20 and the Mass Defense Committee chair for National Lawyers Guild. He's been in court throughout this first J-20 trial. Jude, welcome back to Democracy Now! Explain what has happened so far and the significance of the judge throwing out um, the charge. Great. Thank you so much for having me on again. Um, so, since I was on last, the prosecutor has rested their entire case with all the so-called evidence against the defendants, and then the, the defense has also put on their witnesses um, to, like, as part of their, like, right to have witnesses come and testify on their behalf. That process for the defense was very short, about only about half a day in court. And then um, now it's into the, like, final argument stage. So the prosecutors had their argument first, and then each of the defense attorneys for the defendants are put on their arguments. Uh, this morning at 9.30, there will be the final two defendants will have their closing arguments, and then the prosecutor will do a rebuttal. Then there will be some more kind of like legal housekeeping to do before it goes to the jury. So the judge throwing out the inciting a riot charge was a huge development in the case. It's something that, after the prosecutor rests their case, defense attorneys will almost always file a motion to have the charges dismissed. In D.C., it's called a motion for a judgment of acquittal. And it's a formality, for the most part, is rarely ever successful. So it's really notable that one of the most significant charges um, against the defendants, not only in this trial block, but also in the case as a whole, was found, in this case at least, to have no evidentiary basis at all. So basically, the judge said that the state did not meet the burden of proof, and that charge, therefore, uh, was dismissed, and the jury will not have to deliberate on that one at all. So, but explain what that means, because we're talking about numerous cases that will follow this one. Um, does this judge preside over all of these cases if the inciting to riot remains in the other cases? At this point, the judge is assigned to all the other cases. Uh, it's important to note that there's another case that is scheduled for this coming Monday for seven defendants, but uh, that one probably will not be happening on Monday because the jury will still be deliberating on this case. So it's unclear when the second trial will, will begin. It's looking like it might be in January. And then on March 5th of next year, all the way through October of next year, are all the remaining trials. And starting in May, there's a trial scheduled for every single week. Um, but the judge has indicated that her uh, rotation, her job assignment, is switching from criminal court to family court as of January 2nd. So there will be a new judge or judges beginning in 2018. Why do you see this case as so significant for free speech in the United States? So on January 20th, the police rounded up everyone who they can get a hold of in this vicinity. The police commander who testified at the beginning of trial or towards the beginning of trial um, was very clear, in both in his testimony as well as recordings from the police radio, that they were interested in the protests. It was an anti-fascist, anti-capitalist march. 
And they responded to that kind of preemptively by having uh, around 100 uh, riot cops and, and their, like, lieutenants and, and sergeants and whatnot there at Logan Circle, where the protest was, be, uh, was scheduled to depart from and begin. And uh, that commander said that rather than doing what is typical in D.C., where they do rolling road closures to facilitate the exercise of free speech, instead they showed up with numerous vans full of riot police, and then they followed the march and began pretty much immediately to start to crack down on, on the march. Uh, that commander repeatedly used the word anarchist to describe everybody who was there, and that officer or that commander and other officers talked about everybody being like one group with nefarious intent. Um, so from the, from the outset, because of the um, alleged politics of the march and, and, and uh, the people who were there, the police responded in this very heavy-handed manner that culminated in them rounding everybody up and mass arresting people. And the prosecutor has continued that by going forward with these charges against everyone. So when, when that is the kind of method of operations, for the police going hand in hand with the prosecutor, that sends a very chilling message to anybody who's interested in going out in the streets and voicing dissent, especially dissent to Trump, dissent to uh, the rise of fascism, dissent to white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, like all these other like very devastating systems of oppression. Jude, uh, Assistant U.S. Attorney Qureshi, the second-ranking prosecutor who made closing arguments, said. Um, in those arguments, a street medic was guilty by being present and asked, what do you need a medic with gauze for? She was aiding and abetting the riot. That was her role, Qureshi said. Um, respond to that. So that's an entirely ludicrous claim. Um, medics have been at protests across the country for decades to be able to provide um, first aid type of care to people who are injured in various ways. One of the most notable ways that people get injured at protests, as your listeners and viewers know, is by actions from the police. On January 20th, uh, there was a massive amount of pepper spray deployed by police on people, sometimes directly in the face, sometimes on the side or from behind. Um, and we, we saw this in trial through body cam, uh, body-worn camera videos. There's also a lot of body-worn camera videos of police knocking people down from behind with their batons. One of the officers who testified ran his bike directly into a protester. And so there's all these different ways that the, uh, people who are out there, like in the streets, can get injured very easily. There's also the elements to deal with in January is very cold and for the January 20th uh, inauguration protest. Lots of different reasons why you'd have uh, medics there in order to, like, render aid to people who get injured. Um, the, that prosecutor said that the, um, the supplies that were there kind of showed that, that the medics in general were kind of, like, prepared for war, which is a it's, it's as insulting as it is ludicrous to, to say that people who are out there in the streets were, were prepared for war, especially when you saw the Department of Homeland Security helicopter video showing all the police operations that were happening there in uh, on Inauguration Day, how the police took this, like, paramilitary approach that was also supported by the National Guard in order to, like, corral people and, and use chemical and, and projectile weapons against people. So if there's any kind of warlike conditions that is coming from the police and from the government and not from people who are there to render aid. I want to ask you about some of the videos submitted as evidence in this case by federal prosecutors. This includes video by the Canadian YouTuber Lauren Southern, who the Southern Poverty Law Center describes as, quote, tiptoeing at the precipice of outright white nationalism. Southern was there on January 20th, Inauguration Day, and was kettled during the protest, but was allowed to leave without being arrested. Prosecutors also submitted video evidence from the right-wing militia group Oath Keepers, um, who infiltrated protest planning meetings and secretly recorded them. Prosecutors also presented video from the discredited far-right group Project Veritas just one day after The Washington Post reported Project Veritas had tried to dupe them with a false story of sexual misconduct by a woman undercover pretending to be a victim of Roy Moore. Go into this and why this matters, Jude Ortiz. It's appalling to see so much of the state's—the uh, prosecution's case uh, and, and their so-called like, evidence coming from overtly far-right sources. So the Project Veritas video that you mentioned, it did come out uh, in, in the courtroom as, like, a main piece of evidence exactly, like, one day after that story broke. And 
one would think that that would kind of discredit or like cast into doubt like the the kind of truthfulness or the usefulness of that evidence. The prosecutor and the police officer who was testifying about it gave no indication that the source of it was at, at all even um, a question mark or some some cause of concern. The pro um, the state through various witnesses, uh, the detectives who like testified about the video and whatnot admitted that they did no no kind of forensic investigation uh, or examination of the tape to make sure that it wasn't doctored in some way. Project Veritas, of course, is notorious for doctoring and editing their videos. And um, they were presented to the jury as one of their main pieces of evidence, and especially with the idea of conspiracy. And so, when so much of the so-called evidence against the, these defendants and the defendants in, at large depends on you know, this kind of so-called like, investigative work of far-right actors, it, it really shows how the state itself, like, with their police investigators, undercover cops infiltrating political protest planning meetings, um, the undercover and plainclothes police who were present on, on the march and, like, in the streets that day, all of these different, like, state actors were not able to find the evidence that would substantiate the charges the prosecutor has been so ferociously uh, pursuing. And so they have to supplement that and really kind of uh, create these—the uh, evidentiary base through drawing on the far right. I wanted to ask you about the main detective working full-time on the J-20 case, Gregory Pemberton. On Inauguration Day, January 20th, he tweeted, D.C. police officers used a, quote, inspiring amount of restraint and showed professionalism. Last November, he also tweeted about, quote, disingenuous activists who peddle lies and falsehood. During the J-20 trial, defense lawyers played this clip of an interview Pemberton gave to the far-right media outlet One America News Network, praising President Trump. He certainly has uh, a message of law and order, and he really is appealing to a lot of police officers. Police officers want to hear that someone is going to come in and not allow this divisive vitriolic rhetoric of this false narrative that all police officers are inherently criminal racists that are out here committing crimes against the citizens, and that they're going to come in and put a stop to that. Jude Ortiz, as we wrap up, can you respond to the significance of um, his involvement with the case and what he's saying here? Yes, the Detective Pemberton has claimed that he has looked through hundreds of hours of videos hundreds of times since January 21st. It's been his full-time job, his only assignment. Um, he was able, like, through that review, to present uh, v various uh, compilation boards of photographs, as well as videos and PowerPoints to, to give to the jury for the deliberations that claims to have uh, documentation of the locations of each of the defendants all throughout the march, and presenting this as if that's something that, like, being present, like, in the streets is a sign of guilt and is evidence of the guilt of all these charges. So it was a tremendous amount of work that was, like, put in for these, like, very uh, politically motivated way or reasons. And those political motivations are pretty clear when you look at his Twitter feed with all of the far right uh, and uh, pro-Trump things that he has promoted, and, like, through retweets and through likes and through his own comments on Twitter. He claimed on the stand that that was only in uh, the kind of exercise of his position as a board member of the police union. But whether that's true or whether it's his own personal opinions, those opinions that were put forward are very much in favor of, like, right-wing causes and very much against liberal, progressive, like, radical left causes and um, movements. And he's even done very um, inflammatory and insulting things, like saying black lies matter, L-I-E-S, instead of black lives matter, and discounting that entire movement that has been— um, so prominent in responding to police violence and brutality across the country. Uh, finally, shortly after winning the 2016 presidential election, Donald Trump tweeted his thoughts on dissent. He tweeted, "'Nobody should be allowed to burn the American flag. If they do, there must be consequences, perhaps loss of citizenship or year in jail.'" Your final comment, Jude Ortiz. I think uh, comments like that show the kind of considered effort and nature of repression of social movements in, in the United States. I want to clarify that I mean, like, left social movements, the uh, right social movements that have become more prominent and public under Trump have been facilitated by the state. We're seeing that in places like Charlottesville. We're seeing that in places like 
uh, St. Louis and all across the country. Um, people need to, to recognize how, how things are shifting and um, be ready to be out in resistance to dissent and to not be scared away. <laughs> Um, and this case is a very important part of that. Jude Ortiz, I want to thank you for being with us, member of the organizing crew of Defend J20 and the Mass Defense Committee chair for the National Lawyers Guild. He's been in court throughout this first J20 trial, and we'll keep you updated on this and other trials as they go on. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, the movement to impeach President Trump, where does it stand, from Congress to counties, cities, towns across the United States? Stay with us.